Hello and welcome to English with Greg. In today's lesson, we're going to be, well, I am going to be answering some of your questions about English grammar, English vocabulary, English pronunciation. So come and say hello in the chat. Leave me your questions there and I will be answering them in today's lesson. Also, come and say hello. If, even if you don't have a question, just say hello in the chat. Tell me where you are watching from. And if you're new here, come and subscribe to the channel and have a look at some of my recent videos on advanced English pronunciation, grammar and vocabulary. Uh, okay, so let's have a look. I have a few questions already so I'm going to just answer a few that people have left on various videos recently and we're going to start with one from Easy Life with Lily and uh, she asks could you make a video or answer the question on the difference between the and the. So that's actually a very common question, the pronunciation of the word the. And basically there are two different pronunciations of the word the. One is the, as I just said. Um, and basically we use the when the next word begins with a consonant sound. So that's the, that's the pronunciation you will normally hear and normally use the, the boy, the girl, the table. Okay, with this we use the, the schwa sound, which is the very relaxed uh, uh, uh sound. And it's very, very short, the, the boy, the table, the house. And the other pronunciation is the, and we use this when the next word is followed by a vowel sound. Any vowel sound, not necessarily a vowel letter, but any vowel sound which includes like the apple, the elephant, the ice cream, the aeroplane. Okay, so that is basically the, uh, the difference between the and the. Um, I'm going to have a look at the one more question. Um, before I look at the chat. And again, a very common question. Uh, this actually, Bush, Bushra ans asked this, which accent do I use? And it's a very common question that people, ans that people ask me on, um, on my videos in the comments section. And I am from Yorkshire in the north of England. And I have lived outside of Yorkshire for 20 years now. So when I was a teenager, my Yorkshire accent was very strong. Now it's a little bit more diluted because since I lived in Yorkshire, I have lived in the south of England. I've lived in France, in Spain, in the United States and now again in Spain. So definitely uh, a reduced strength of accent, but there are still many characteristics of the Yorkshire accent in my accent, specifically the, the uh sound. A lot of people say, hey, is it, uh, why are you saying cup instead of cup? That's the reason, because in the in the middle and north of England, we use a uh sound for words like cup and up and put. Put the cup up there. Uh, uh, uh. And in the south of England, they would say put the cup up there. And maybe in other uh, parts of London, Cockney accent, it might resemble more an ah. Uh, sound. Pat the, cap, pat the cap up there. Okay, let's have a look at the chat then. Um, as I said, we are live on YouTube. I'm here to answer your questions. So if you have any questions about grammar, any problems, 
any confusion between two different words, two different expressions, ask me in the chat if you are having difficulties with uh, the pronunciation of a particular sound or a particular word in English, ask me in the chat. Um, and if you have any questions about British culture, also feel free to ask me in the chat and I will answer as many questions as I can in the next 40 minutes, more or less. Let's see. <laughs> if nobody asks any questions, then it will be much shorter, but I have about 40 minutes. Okay, so hello everybody who is joining live. Thank you all so much for, for being here. Um, we have people from Brazil, Russia, Poland, Germany, India, um, Barcelona. So, Joanna, what's the weather like? Very common question in, uh, in British culture. And right now, we've had a beautiful week. And right now, just in time for the weekend, the weather is going downhill. It's going worse. It's going to rain this weekend. But um, it's not such a problem for me. I, I, tend, I, I look after my daughter, who is two years old. I look after her every morning and we always go out we always go out and if it's nice weather during the week we go out we have fun we go for a walk go to the beach um so i don't necessarily need nice weather at the weekend um english club says please do the live on the daily basis i would love to but i really um don't have that much time um i wish i did but my work time is very, very limited. Mabel Iglesias Bilarino says, hi, Greg from Santiago. And hello from Santiago. I am also in Santiago. So beautiful place. Um, okay. So first grammar question here. And Suzanne would like to know the difference between should and ought to. Let's do that question first. Really, they, the meaning is exactly the same. You should stop smoking. You ought to stop smoking. Okay, oh, it's getting late. I should go now. I ought to go now. They're both, the meaning is exactly the same. Um, but should is more common, in my opinion. Um, I think ought to is a little bit more formal, but the meaning is the same. Uh, the difference between floor and ground, generally, floor is inside a building and ground is outside a building, in the street, in the field, in the garden, that is the ground. Um, and yeah, prefer and would rather. Again, the difference mainly is, is the grammatical construction, so, but the meaning is the same. Um, so, I, what do you like, Greg? Football or rugby? Uh, I prefer football. I prefer football. So, after prefer, we use a noun, like football, or a gerund, like playing. I prefer playing football. I prefer watching football. After would rather, we can um, only use a verb, and we use the verb in the infinitive. I would rather have a cup of tea. Do you want a coffee? Uh, I would rather have a cup of tea. I prefer tea. Okay, but the meaning is the same. Um, English club, what does cigarette butt mean? Uh, is that your question? What does cigarette butt mean? Cigarette butt means when somebody smokes a cigarette and they finish their cigarette and they do this, then what is left is a cigarette butt. Okay. Um, all right. Another one from uh, Joanne. From my experience, what do most of you have the biggest problem with? Grammar or fear of speaking? And why is it 
Why is it so that we know a lot of words but cannot say it in conversation? Okay, so in my experience, people maybe maybe worry too much about grammar. I'm not. <clears throat> I like <clears throat> I like teaching grammar, but I'm not uh, such a. I, I I don't really think it's the most important. Thing to know. You can have a nice conversation with bad grammar, but you can't have a nice conversation without, you know, if, without any confidence in speaking. If you are completely afraid of speaking, you can't enjoy a nice conversation. Um, so uh, I think most people who start learning with me and with my academy, most people come to me with the problem of having a fear of speaking. And this is probably because most people that I personally teach are, or until recently, were Spanish people in Spain. And here in Spain, they, they tend to learn a lot of grammar at school. They'll put a lot of focus on learning grammar rules and not a lot of focus on speaking. So, the grammar usually isn't a problem, but people are afraid to, to, to speak, to make mistakes, to not be understood. And that's the skill that I like teaching people. And that's why I always say that my objective is to help people speak advanced English. I'm not particularly bothered about how people write English. Uh, the grammar is important, but my main objective in everything I do is to help people have a confident conversation, uh, which is clear and easy to understand. And uh, the problem of knowing a lot of words and not being able to use it in conversation is more or less the same thing. I mean, a lot of, in a lot of cases, when you learn vocabulary, you, you, your teacher at school says, okay, here is a list of vocabulary that you, that, that we, you know, things in the house, for example, and your homework is to learn all these 30 words, and on Monday you have an exam, and you have to translate the words, but that's not very useful if you don't use it in context and in conversation. So I think the reason people have problems is because of the way they learn. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> Mabel, I, I know. I read your name before I realized you were Spanish. Um, <laughs> in English, it's Mabel. But then I realized you were Spanish. And yeah, Mabel, of, of course. Okay, um, I'm looking so smart. Thank you. I I like to. I need to wear white um, because the background is so dark on these, and I only really have one white thing, which is uh, a shirt, kind of shirt. Okay, let's have a look. So another difference. What's the difference between until and till? Nothing. They both mean the same thing. And uh, till is just, it's a shorter version of until. So when we're speaking, you will often hear people say till. I'm here till Friday. Okay. How long are you stopping here in this hotel? Oh, I'm, I'm staying here till Friday. It just means until Friday. It's just a short version. Uh, what's the difference between to be and being? It's the same verb, to be, but we just use them in different grammatical constructions. And that all depends on the context, what verb you are using it with. Okay, bitu, bitu. Um, how can I improve my British accent? I have, I have one golden rule for speaking with a British accent. 
And that is the rule, the pronunciation rule, that when you have a vowel sound that is followed by the letter R, the letter R must be silent, completely silent. This is one really, really strong characteristic of British English. This rule does not exist in American English. So if we use the word, you know, this car in English, it has two sounds, k -ar. It finishes with the letter R, but the R is completely silent. And of course, in American, it's car, car with the r sound, which I can't do. But if you want to speak with a more British accent, that is the best thing you can start by doing. Delete every R after a vowel sound. Okay, should we use a particular topic to improve our spoken English or should we go through general talk? This depends on why you need English. Um, and my recommendation is to practice English, practice spoken English related to the topics that you specifically need. For example, I used to work, before I was a teacher, I used to work in a company that sold fabric. It manufactured fabric and exported the fabric all over the world to make things like office chairs, things like that. And I was communicating with French people and, uh, well, French, Belgian people. I was speaking French and Spanish in my in my daily job and I was very confident in, in Spanish but not too confident in French because I hadn't spoken it for a few years so I focused my French speaking and, and learning on vocabulary related to my work to fabric to deliveries to delays to everything that I might need to talk about in French so that's my answer. Try to be a little bit specific. If you never talk about dancing, then there's not a lot of point learning specific vocabulary um, and, and feeling really confident speaking about dancing. Okay, difference between since and from. Um, Hmm. From is usually, I'm, I'm, I think from is usually in, in the future. So usually, not always, because you can say from the age of, from the age of 23, I have been living abroad. Um, but generally, yeah, the, the, um, the event or you can come to our house from five o'clock okay that means at five o'clock and after okay from five o'clock from five o'clock that so five six seven eight it's it's all good since is um definitely always in the past okay i have lived in santiago since i was oh since three years ago Okay, I have been learning languages since I was a child. So since, definitely always the past. From is more uh, used in the future. Uliana, hello. Can you explain the difference in pronunciation between the long oo and the short one? Like boot and cook. Yes. As I said Earlier, my accent is from the north of England, and we have a very strong uh sound, like cook, a very short, uh, a very strong short uh, and we use this short uh in many places, um, like cup, where you will see a phoneme, a phonetic symbol like this, um, and basically, 
the short one, like cook, cook, cook. Look at the shape of my mouth. This is important. Cook, cook. So I've got a very relaxed mouth. Cook. Very relaxed mouth. It's a very, very short sound. Cook. And if I do the long one, like boot, boo, oo, look at the shape of my mouth, the now, oo, boot. It has to be with this oo shape. If you don't change the shape of your mouth when you're talking, you will find it very difficult to make the correct sounds. So it's always important to focus on the shape of your mouth, what you do with your tongue, the position of your tongue, what you do with the back of your mouth, and what you do with your voice. Like, is it on uh, or off? Like, nothing. Um, and in this case, it's a long sound with this shape. Ooh, boot, cook. Let's have a look at this one. Um, hi, Greg. I'd like to ask about the past perfect. That's, for example, I had eaten. Can I replace it with another tense? When I came, everyone um, were already gone. No, that's incorrect. Instead of when I came, everyone had already left. No, you can't. Um, when I came, everybody was gone. It's incorrect. Maybe you might hear some native speakers um, speaking like that, but it's incorrect. Okay, um, Mr. Patel, um, hello. What's the difference between apologize and sorry? Apologize is the verb, and sorry is just the thing you say. So uh, I need to apologize to my neighbor. I'm bye. I'm going to apologize to my neighbor now. Bop, bop, bop. Hi, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay, so it's like an adjective. I am sorry or just sorry. So somebody asked me earlier, what's the difference between ground and floor? Hadi says, what about ground floor? Yes. So if you enter a building with like a big, big skyscraper, big block of offices, then when you enter, before you get the lift to go to the first floor, second floor, ninth floor, when you enter, that is the ground floor. Okay. It's the same level as the street. And this can cause confusion between Americans and British people. Because in American, it's that same level is called the first floor. In British, it's the ground floor. And the first floor is the, the next one up. Ah, how to use the prep preposition to um, in so many ways that I can't even answer that question. Um, it depend learn when you learn a verb. Don't just learn the verb. If you learn the verb ask, for example, don't just learn the word ask. Don't think, okay, in my language it's this, and in English it's ask. That's not enough. When you learn a new verb, learn how to use it. So you want to learn the expression, ask someone to do something. Ask him to call me. Okay, and that way, it will become easier for you to learn how to use the verbs correctly, whether to use to or for or which preposition. And then, and if you do that, then you will have less questions like, oh, is it to, is it for, when do I use to, I don't know. Um, how's life? Okay. Apart from the virus, it's okay. Um, okay. Mabel. 
how to pronounce this sort of con contraction. She probably would have signed out for would have, would have. This is um, a real problem that na some native speakers have because you learn by speaking, obviously, and uh, the, the pronunciation of this would have, would have, is the same as if we wrote would of, O-F, of. A lot of native speakers write would of instead of would have. Um, because the pronunciation is almost identical as would of. Say it quickly, would have, would have. Okay, let's have a look. Um, Esther Lorenti. I can't understand why in these phrases the prepositions are different. I saw the information in a YouTube video and I'm learning you English on YouTube. Okay, the difference is because if we have a website, the preposition is on. Everything related to the internet is on. On the internet, on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. On, 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 on your website. With the, with the word video, then the preposition is in or on. I, I saw it on a video. I saw it in a video. Mm, both work okay. So the difference, the reason these are different is because in is referring to the video, not to YouTube. It's referring to a video. And in the second one, I'm learning English on YouTube. There, there we are referring to YouTube, which is a website or platform. Raul, uh, one question about the word ever. How do you use it? Well, one common way of using it is asking somebody about a life experience. Yes or no. Have you ever... Ba, ba, ba. Have you ever been to Africa? Have you ever um, played ice hockey? Have you ever sung in public? Have you ever... Ba, ba, ba. That is one common way. Um, we can also use it in to accentuate never. Like, I have never been to Ireland. You could say, I have never, ever been to Ireland. Okay, let's have a look here. I make some videos on English movies and some interviews, then explain it and make some of, uh, for the use of gotta, okay. Well, gotta <laughs> is a contraction of got to. So I have got to go. Instead of saying I have got to go, we can just say I've got to go. I've got to, got to, got to go. I've got to go. Um, and yeah, regarding the other part, if you ever have, if you ever have, like in any moment, if you ever have um, any suggestions about YouTube videos, just leave a comment on any video. It doesn't matter which video. Leave me a comment. Um, if you're on my mailing list, email me and request a video because they are the videos that I love doing the most, the ones that you request because if you have this problem then i'm sure thousands of other students have the same problem so just tell me and i love answering your questions on uh, on on my videos this is a interesting one how to use though after a sentence. 
Um, okay. So the uh, though is this this uh, this word. Sometimes you see see the short version. Uh, the short version is this. You don't often see it in British English, but um, but this is the real spelling of that word. And when do we use it? Because we can use it. You are right at the end of uh, at the end of a sentence. For example, where is that question? Sorry. Um, there we go, Nelly. Do um, okay. I'm trying to think of uh, an example. Did you did you go to the beach this weekend? No, I didn't. I went to the swimming pool though. So it, it's it's almost like we are putting however at the beginning of a sentence. However, I went to the swimming pool. So it's a similar thing, but we just put it at the end of the sentence. And it's very, very, very common in spoken English. Very common. Not in written English, but in spoken English, it's a really, really common thing to do. Pedro, if I had if I have the opportunity to travel to Ireland or the UK to improve my English. To, to improve my English, which one would you choose? It um, really, Pedro Pena, with a name like that, I imagine you're Spanish. So, if you are, I would have to say Ireland, because Ireland is still in the European Union and England is not. So, um, I imagine it's easier in terms of paperwork and to find employment if you choose Ireland. However, um, I, I don't know much about Ireland, really. I know many places in England which are beautiful. I don't know much about Ireland, apart from they have quite a strong accent, but I know many people who have been to Ireland and loved it, had a fantastic experience. Alice G, what's the difference between during and throughout, if there is one? Not much, not much. Uh, during the week, throughout the week. I think throughout really just accentuates the, like the, the, the length of time, really. Yeah, I, um, I, tr I, I, I traveled to Asia throughout the year. I mean, from January to December, on a regular basis, I traveled to Asia throughout the year. It really accentuating that period of time. If I say I went to Asia during the year, um, maybe it's once, maybe twice, but it's, it's not really giving that importance to the, the duration. But the meaning is, yeah, almost the same. During is a lot more common. Okay, uh, Sunkara, I, um, I know your name. Thank you for your support. Uh, commenting often, and what's what is going to some going to do something mean in English? How do we, how do native speakers use it? Well, it's just to talk about the future. Um, we have two ways of talking about the future, will and going to. And my general rule is that if something is in your diary, if you have it in your calendar and it's a plan, then we use going to. Right? If I say I will go to the dentist next month, it's not a plan. Um, it's something I've decided right now. Oh, my tooth hurts. I will. I'll go to the dentist next month. But if I say I'm going to, I'm going to the dentist, or I'm going to go to the dentist next month, then we know that it's a plan. I have it in my diary, and it is happening. So 
Suman, is there any difference between he only has one pair of shoes and he has a uh, he has one pair of shoes only and he has only one pair of shoes? There's one pair of shoes only. Um, the middle one, he has one pair of shoes only, sounds not natural to me. I would only use this when I say the expression, he has one pair of shoes only. Like only is something I've thought of after I've spoken. However, between the first and the third one, he only has one pair of shoes and he has only one pair of shoes. In the second one, he has only one pair of shoes. We are accentuating, putting more emphasis on, on, on the word one. And in the first one, he only has one pair of shoes. We are putting more emphasis on the word has. Both mean the same. Um, and the more common of those expressions is the first one. He only has one pair of shoes. Yeah, the most common way to use only is by putting it directly before the main verb. But as you can see with this example, it is possible to move it to accentuate a different part of the sentence. Okay, um, let's go. Hugo, um, I live in Spain. I live in Santiago de Compostela in the north of Spain. My wife is from near here and I came here in 2004 just for one year and uh, met my future wife and lived here and lived in different places um, but since then and now but eventually we got married here and we and we now live here. Okay, Joanne, do you have a list of the most frequently used phrasal verbs? Not I don't, and I don't, I don't recommend you learn lists of phrasal verbs. I don't find it to be super useful. Uh, I think there are better ways of doing it. One way is to think of topics like travel, for example, and think, okay, which phrasal verbs are there related to travel? And learn a few phrasal verbs related to travel. I also think it's good practice to maybe create a little story using these phrasal verbs so that you can learn them in context, okay? So you're, you're thinking, okay, when I go on my holidays, I pick up my suitcase, I check it in at the airport, I sit down on the airplane, and I fall asleep on the plane. Things like this, okay, learn them in context. But I think, I, and I have had school children who I taught in the past who came to me and said, hey, I have homework. I have to learn 50 phrasal verbs for an exam on Monday, help. And, and you know, they learned them, they, they memorized them, and I'm sure the day after the exam, they forgot them. So not such an effective way of, of learning. Kasha, hi, does it sound silly for natives when they hear foreigners who do a strong, who have a strong British accent? It sounds amazing. It sounds so, like for example, a Polish person who speaks English with a very, very strong English accent. Yeah, it sounds amazing. Um, really, really impressive, really impressive. Not silly at all. And, and and really, when you have a strong accent from your country also, you should never feel silly. That You really shouldn't because you are doing something that most English people cannot do, and that is have a conversation in a different language. So you should never feel silly when you're speaking English, regardless of your accent.
Um, okay. Answered and replied. What's the difference between answered and replied? I replied to your email. I answered your email. Uh, context, but um, with email, you can reply to an email or you can answer an email. Just be careful that reply with reply, we need the preposition to. I replied to your email. I answered your email. No preposition with to. Uh, so with writing, with letters, with email, we can use both. Um, with speaking, uh, hey Greg, I've asked you this already, and I say, uh, yeah, I've already, I've already answered you. Um, I've already replied to you. Answered is best, certainly more common when we when we're having uh, speak, spoken communication. Um, and yeah, on the telephone, I answered the phone. I answered the phone, not I replied. So generally, if you think answer is for speaking, reply and answer is for writing, it's not a rule, but it usually works. Uh, Carla is one of my lovely students. Uh, in my WhatsApp course, and thanks for being here. Okay, what's the difference between themselves and themselves, ourselves and ourself? Okay, we did ask. Well, with with V E S themselves ourselves that is correct um ourself with an f i think is incorrect i can't i can't imagine a situation where that is correct ourself no um themselves he did it they did it themselves um themselves with an f maybe it exists You've planted a little bit of doubt in my mind, but we can use the word they to talk about one person if we don't know if it's a man or a woman. So imagine my wife answers the phone and she says, hey, Greg, it's somebody from the insurance company. And I say, oh, what do they want? What do they want? What does that person want? What do they want? Because I can't say what does he want because I don't know if it's a man. I can't say, I don't, what does she want? Because I, I, I don't know if she's a woman. So I use a neutral word, what do they want? Um, okay, so then my wife might say, ah, oh, they want to, um, they want you to tell them the address. I could say, well, tell them to look for it themselves on the internet, themselves. So related to one person in a neutral way, I might say themselves. Okay. Ram says, are you mad? Not yet, Ram. No. Not yet. Okay. Being and gone. Stir and mix. Oof. Okay. Being and gone is a, is a common one. And let's use the example of my wife going to the supermarket. My wife has been to the supermarket or my wife has gone to the supermarket. There's a big difference here. If I say my wife has gone to the supermarket, that means that she left the house, she went to the supermarket and she is at the supermarket now. If I say my wife has been to the supermarket, that means she left the house, she went to the supermarket, she bought the food, and she came home. So it's a complete visit. I have been is a complete visit. I have gone means you are still there. And when we use this in a negative way, for example, I haven't been to the dentist for six months, it needs to be been 
because we're talking about the complete visit. I haven't been to the cinema for over a year. Okay, um, somebody asked me earlier, how do we use though at the end of a sentence? And this is a perfect example. I love French, but it's hard to learn though. We can delete the word but, because it's kind of the same. It, it, we're kind of duplicating that feeling there. I love French. It's hard to learn though. That is a perfect example of how to use though at the end of a Sentence. Okay, it's good to see everybody here. Um, by the way, from Argentina, Brazil, um, India, all over the place. Okay, Jumei Lin, why do we call modern received pronunciation? Why received? What it was received? So, Everybody has an accent, okay? I, I, I really hate it when people say, oh, I have a neutral accent. There's, not, there's no such thing as a neutral accent. Everybody has an accent. It depends where you're from. Um, and I, as I said, I have a, a, a Northern English accent. And re received pronunciation is how people were taught it, it's almost a, a fake accent it be, i think or it was originally because it was how people were taught to speak okay so a very typical example is the bbc if you listen to the bbc in the 50s they speak with an accent that almost doesn't exist now it was it was called the bbc accent or or received pronunciation, because that is how elocution teachers taught people to speak. Like, you must speak like this if you want to appear high class and intelligent and have great job opportunities and be highly uh, regarded in society. So it was, it was given, this accent was given to students and, and they received it, okay? So it's received pronunciation. So as I said, if you listen to the BBC in uh, in the 50s, wow, what a difference to, to nowadays because modern received pronunciation is kind of the, the evolution of that. It's not the old received pronunciation. It's, uh, it's modern. Let's have a look then. Which preposition is correct? I am in the car. I am on the car. Um, I am in the car. Yeah, if you're sitting down, you are in the car. Generally, if, if you or if something is in a thing that is enclosed, then you are in. Like a house, I'm in a house. I'm in, um, or the 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 money is in the wallet. I am in the car. I did see. I went to a cafe this morning and I saw something on the television on the news of some crazy guy who was on the car, like surfing, on on the car. So I am on the car is correct, but illegal. How to be motivated for studies? Well, if you have a, an end goal, my advice is just, why do you want to learn English? Why, why do you want to reach an advanced level? And imagine your life when you have that level. How will it be different? Will you have a better job? Will you be able to travel? If you want to take an exam to study in a different, country, then imagine your life in that different country. Um, imagine how good that feels, or that would feel. 
Focus on that. Okay, let's have a look. Ooh, okay, I've got lost here. But, all right, there we go. Okay. All right, then, Alexand Alexandra ba Barrientos. Um, what's the difference between take and have? For example, take a shower or have a shower. In American English, take is much more common for things like this. If you say, I'm going to take a shower, it's perfectly understandable. But in British English, we normally use have for these expressions. Have a shower, have lunch, have a beer, have a cup of tea, have a, uh, have a walk. And in American English, it's they tend to use take. Take a shower, take a walk, take a take a beer. Um, how do you pronounce get out? In many different ways, but uh, you could say get out, get out. You would also maybe say, maybe, um, not pronounce the final T, like use a glottal stop, like out, out, get out. You could also use that for both T's, like get out. Um, in American English, you would pronounce the first T like an R, get out, get out. Or oh, sorry, like a D, get out, get out. So standard way is get out, get out. What is accent reduction? Well, basically, as I said before, nobody should feel silly about having an accent when they speak in English, because um, everybody has an accent. Wherever you are from in England, you have an accent, and it's not a bad thing. I'm from the North. People recognize me as somebody from the North because of my accent. It's equally correct as somebody who speaks from the South or from South Africa, America, Australia, Scotland, they're all correct. If somebody speaks English, some, a German person speaks English with a German accent, or an Indian person speaks English with an Indian accent, again, it's, it's, it's where you're from. So it, it's not something to feel ashamed of. However, sometimes a very strong foreign accent can make it difficult for native speakers to understand you. And then it does become a problem. So accent reduction is just reducing your accent, making, not, not saying, okay, we don't want anybody to know you're from India. No, not that. Just saying, let's make it less strong so that it's easier to understand. And that's important too, okay? Having an Indian accent is Fine, no problem, but it is a problem if people can't understand you. So we want to reduce your accent. My best wine is best an adjective? Yes. Well, it's a superlative, but yeah, it's 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 the adjective. Proverbs, yeah, I love proverbs. Um I have my recent video from last week, I teach you some idioms, not proverbs, but idioms, very similar. I recommend you watch that one from last week. That's a very quick video, six minutes, bam, 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 21 idioms I teach you. So I recommend you watch that one. Yeah, um, I live in Spain. I wondered if you are Spanish or a native speaker. I am an, a native English speaker. I, I studied French at university. I lived in France as part of my university studies for one year. I loved the experience. So 
after my university studies, I wanted to repeat the experience and I knew a little bit of Spanish, so I came to Spain. I loved the culture of Spain, so I, I came to Spain. And uh, it was always a language that I really liked, really liked and found quite easy to learn. When you have learned French and you have learned Italian, like I had, then Spanish is quite easy to learn. There you go. We should be proud of our accents. Absolutely. Nelly says, do I have a website? And yes, I do, Nelly. It's um, englishwithgreg.com, actually. There you go. Englishwithgreg.com. I made that a few months ago, so it's quite new. But I put my courses there. I have, um, at the moment, three courses. One is specifically for Spanish speakers, and the other two are for everybody. And one is a pronunciation course, and one is a, a course that I run via WhatsApp, which is great. And, yeah, a lot of fun. I give feedback via WhatsApp on people's spoken English and help them with their pronunciation and grammar and vocabulary. So it's a... It's it really it's the best way of learning um, and teaching for people who are busy and for teachers who are busy too. So check out the website. It's englishwithgreg.com and there you will see a little bit about me and my courses. Okay, there we go. Teach me English, please. Yes, that is what I'm doing. Right, is someone in a C1 level able to watch movies without subtitles, even if the actors speak in an accent and faster than usual? Maybe, yeah. C1 level is a good level to have. If you watch movies with subtitles, put the subtitles in English, not in your language. I don't know if that is something that you do, but never watch English movies to improve your English and and read the subtitles in your language. It's super like counterproductive. Your brain is working in two languages. Um, but yeah, I would have put the subtitles. Sometimes I put the subtitles um, when I'm watching things in a foreign language and it's it's okay, it's okay. Try not to obsess about them. But that it's it's good if you want to just enjoy the film. If they're there in case you have a, a problem understanding a, a particular person. Okay, hit a big like. Yeah, thanks. In fact, if you are watching live now, and I know a lot of you are, please click the like button. That will really help me. Um, and if you are new, please subscribe to the channel too. Okay, let's have a look here. Why can't we understand native speakers but not speak like natives? Um, because there are two different skills. One is receptive, like reading and listening, they are receptive. And the other ones are, uh, what's the opposite? I don't know, productive? No. Can't remember the word, but you're producing. You are producing the the uh, the language. It's much a much more difficult skill to speak like a native or to speak perfectly or um, yeah than to listen. Same with reading. I mean, you can read a text and more or less understand what is written. You don't need to understand every word when you are reading or listening. You don't need to. Sometimes if I'm listening to a native speaker, maybe I don't understand every word. Maybe they speak too quickly or don't pronounce one word correctly or they use a word I don't know. You don't need to understand every word. But when you're speaking, you do. 
How can I understand I would or I had? I'd, I'd. Yeah, they are identical. Um, but they are used in different grammatical constructions. So if you say I, I would go, I'd go. But it's not possible to say I had go. That's in, that's grammatically incorrect. It's I'd, I had gone. So if you say I'd gone, we know that I'm saying I had. If we say I'd go, it, we know that I'm saying I would. So the context tells us which one we need. Hungary, Budapest was one of my favorite places I visited on my interrail. Uh, in 2006, I went on an interrail, which is, uh, it's something that's quite cheap, a cheap way of visiting lots of countries in Europe. I bought one train ticket and you can use it for one month around most European countries and you have one train ticket. You show it on any train and you can just travel around Europe. And uh, I did that in for one month in 2006. Went to like 10 or 12 countries in one month. And Hungary, Budapest, was my favorite city. Loved it. Yeah, you see this word a lot on YouTube, unboxing. So if you get a new product, um, a phone, a microphone, a new camera, unboxing means taking it out of the box. So these YouTube videos will often be the unboxing. So they tell you and explain what to expect, what is going to happen if I buy this microphone. You get it in a box and you see somebody taking it out of the box. What's it like? What does it come with? Um, that you see people plugging it in. How does it work? Does it work immediately? Blah, blah, blah. So it's um, that is unboxing. There you go. Lots of gizzes from Italy. I, another country I love. My ancestors were Italian from Tuscany. It's a beautiful part of the world. Yes. Okay. Here we go, Mike. Mike, uh, be about to is a really good expression to use. Um, I am about to do it. I was about to do it. And it just means that you very, very soon you are, you are in, you are just going to do it in one second or in a few seconds time. If somebody calls me, I can say, oh, I was, I was about to call you. In other words, I was I was going to call you. I was just in that moment. I was going to call you. I was about to call you. Okay. Hey, do you live here? Yes, we live here, but we are about to move house. We're about to move house. In other words, very very shortly, we are going to move house. Okay, Arson. Uh, thanks for making the effort to teach people from all over the world. You know, that is one real great thing about this channel that I love. Um, you know, this is my job teaching English, but the the more the channel grows, the more I really love this aspect of it, that I can teach people from every country in the world. It's It's so amazing, really. It's such a great thing. So you're welcome. I enjoy it and I'm glad to help. Okay. Whoa. Okay. I got loads of loads here. Okay. I don't know how I, I don't know how long I can go on here, but uh, let me I'm gonna have to go around go down these questions quickly and miss a few out. Um, okay, what's the question? I'm in-house or I'm at home? I am at home is the correct one. Uh, this one, I would love to. Come to, come to India. Come to India. One day, maybe, when this virus goes away, 
my brother has the uh, oh, before the virus, my brother used to go to India a lot with work to Mumbai. Bexel says, what's my favorite sport? Ooh, uh, football. I love football. My favorite team is Liverpool. I love watching Liverpool. Um, okay. Okay, so I have a lot of uh, a lot of comments that I hadn't seen, but most of them are this. <sighs> you tell me. Yep, I'm from England, from a small town in West Yorkshire, near Leeds. If you know Leeds. Um, if you know Huddersfield, I am near there. How many meanings of the word appropriate? Uh, I don't know, really. Um, one, it's appropriate. It means it's, yeah, it's. It's good, it's appropriate. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's the right thing is happening in the right setting. The opposite is inappropriate. So inappropriate if you know if somebody is using bad language, bad words in a formal situation, that is inappropriate. And the opposite is appropriate. Rahul, we are live. Yes, I have wanted to do a live lesson for a long, long time. My last live lesson was in October, and since then I have had terrible trouble with my internet. And finally, two weeks ago, I got it fixed. And I was like, yes, finally I can do a live lesson. So that's why I'm doing it today. Okay. As you live in Spain, you're supposed to speak Spanish. Do you think that it helps to, um, to understand Portuguese? If so, when I become fluent in English, what language do you consider easiest to learn? Okay. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what you want to ask there. What, like after you learn English, what's the next easiest language to learn? Mm. Or is it easier to learn Spanish or Portuguese? Uh, I don't know Portuguese very well. Um, so I would say that English, the Spanish is quite an easy language to learn, I think. Um, but I don't, I, don't, I don't really know. Um, okay, Greg, I watch a lot of channels. You are the one who made a channel with passion, with a smile and pleasure. Thanks for that. You go to the kids. Okay, thanks for being here, Joanne. And thanks for your comments. Yeah, YouTube is... I've been doing it for almost four years. And, you know, you see some channels that grow, grow, grow so quickly. Uh, my channel has not had that fortune it's growing slow so 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 slowly but one thing is for sure if you don't enjoy it then quit now and um, because it's a lot of work a lot of patience and um you have to enjoy it yeah it's the same with your english though it's the same with your english you have to find a way to enjoy learning english to see results without question and you know there are always ways to enjoy learning english different things you can do you can learn english by watching youtube videos or going learning if grammar is your thing you can learn by doing grammar you can listen to podcasts though you can watch netflix you can uh, have classes with native teachers you can there's so many different ways. You find the way that you enjoy doing something and it becomes 
much easier to do. Uh, Greg, as a native speaker and English teacher, do you understand every and each and every single word in movies? No, I don't. So you should not either. If you are ever worried that you don't understand every word, that should not be your objective. When you are listening to a song in English, when you're watching a TV series or movie in English, or when you're having a conversation in English with someone, your objective should not, never, should never be to understand every word because it's an unrealistic expectation. And if that's your objective, you won't do it. And then you will get demotivated and worried and, oh, I didn't understand. And no, you need to keep confident and just think, I am not going to understand every word here. My objective is to understand the sense, understand the meaning, the global meaning of the conversation. Chloe, nice name. I, my daughter's middle name is Chloe, and um, you have a new British co-worker at work. <laughs> is there any typical or special expression to say hi? Or good morning that only British people use. Um, where where is he from in England? Where I'm from in the in Yorkshire, we say a up, a up, a up. Um, in Ireland, they say a very typical one is top of the morning, top of the morning, top of the morning to you, top of the morning to you. But a general British one instead of good morning. Just morning, morning, okay? So delete the G at the end, delete the word good to say morning. Okay, let's have a look at some more. Um, Okay, what's the difference between special and a special? Um, a special is incorrect and special, the first one, is correct. Can I help you learn listening? Listening is something that you have to do yourself and I have a two videos, I think, on different things you can do to improve your listening. I did a video with a friend, the Canadian teacher, and we talked about different things you can do, 17 different things you can do to improve your listening. So search for that on my channel. I did a video also on my own in which I chose my top five options. That's a shorter video and search for that, search for improve listening on my YouTube channel um, to, to just to have some ideas of things you can do to improve your listening. Um, I speak, well, it depends who I'm talking to. It depends, but usually, Spanish, but um, I mean, at the moment, ah, in fact, at the moment, that's maybe not true because at the moment now I have two, two children who I speak English to. My wife, I used to speak Spanish to my wife, but we changed when we went to live in uh, the United States. We changed to speaking English to each other. And then when we came back to Spain, we had a daughter, so we kept English as the family language. Hi, Franco. Can you tell us some expressions related to the COVID-19 vaccination? You know what, Franco, the less I think about COVID-19 and the less I think about the vaccinations, the better. I'm fed up. So, 
I try not to talk about it, try not to read about it, and just try to forget about it. Uh, this app that I'm using now is maybe up there, StreamYard. Really good. I love being able to bring the comments in so that you can see. Uh, so that you can see what everybody is writing. Oh, okay, let me have a look. This is something that most native speakers don't know. Um, and most native speakers use who? for everything. Whom is uh, not used very often, to be honest, when we're speaking, you people usually don't use whom. When you're writing, you will, when you're writing a formal thing, you will need to know how to use whom in the right sense. My little trick is that when it comes after a preposition, then we would use whom. To whom? To whom are you speaking? In general, spoken English, we would say, who are you speaking to? My explanation about the difference between the past perfect continuous and the past perfect um, continuous or progressive was top notch. Thanks a lot. You know, that video, was ama I mean, amazing in in the fact that I don't know what happened, but YouTube pushed it a little bit, and wow, I, I saw more views on that than on any other video. The statistics went woof, and it was fantastic because because of that video, lots and lots of people discovered this channel. So I just want ink. I would like YouTube to do that for more, for more videos. Uh, hello, it's Mia from India. So take down and write. You know, most verbs have a or, well, all phrasal verbs, most phrasal verbs, I would say, maybe all, have an alternative, which is just one word. Um, however, the phrasal verb is usually the more common one. And take down just means the same thing, really, as write. Okay, let me take down your number. It's just really informally, a very casual, a very short thing about um, to write something, maybe a telephone number, maybe um, you're having a little meeting with someone and you take down some notes, okay? So it's not, you know, you're not writing a, a big essay, a big, you're not writing a book, a report, an article. It's just, you're taking down some notes. It's informal, it's, it's a casual thing. Okay, we are almost, I think, coming to the end. And I am going to have to stop soon because this has been much longer than I thought. Um, but it's nice. It's, as I said before, it's really nice to do a live lesson. I've wanted to do it for so long. And it's really nice to connect a bit better with, my, with you, with the people who watch my videos. So hopefully I can do this more often. Now my internet is fixed. Okay. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. What's this one then? Which English club has asked a lot. Can we learn English with the help of academic books? 
Or should we go with daily use sentences, phrases? Yeah, I mean, you certainly can learn with, if you're interested and if it's useful, then yeah, chemistry, maths. Um, where I used to live in the States, they had a system of, of dual language education and, and the children learned everything in Spanish as a second language. Um, they started with 10%, 10% Spanish, and then it gradually got 50%, and then gradually 100%. But all these things, chemistry, maths, biology, everything was in the foreign language. So it's, uh, it's, it's certainly, certainly good. Keep it interesting for you. You know, if chemistry is interesting for you, then it's a good thing to do. Um, I really, really improved my French when I was a teenager by reading football and talking about football and writing to people on the internet about football in French. And I knew all the football vocabulary that I could ever imagine. And it was it just, it was interesting for me. So it was motivating and when it's motivating, it's the easiest to improve. Um, okay. I think I'm going to stop. Uh, I'll do a few more. Is impressed? Impressed? Does always does that always take the preposition with? I'm impressed. I'm impressed with the monument. I'm impressed by the monument. Impressed with you. By. By. By is the. I'm impressed. I'm impressed with. Maybe with is okay too, but by is certainly the most common. Yes, Luis, I heard just before the live lesson, Prince Philip, 99 years of age, passed away this morning. Sad day for the royal family. Uh, Carmen Parla. Sorry, I thought I knew you, but my friend is has one letter different than you in her name. <laughs> uh, anyway, what is the fastest way to learn English? Um, not living in an English-speaking country. There are so many things that you do on a daily basis that you can do in English. Put your phone in English. Don't watch the news in your language. What's the what's the news in English? Listen to English podcasts. Take English lessons, conversation lessons, um, or or speak to English native speakers or not native English speakers. But use use English, use spoken English at every opportunity, and at every opportunity can be on your own. You could be. Oh, you could be at home cooking, you could be brushing your teeth, you could be in the shower, but you could be thinking in English or speaking in English to yourself. It's, it's a great, it sounds crazy, but it's a great thing to do. I did that often when I was, I remember I was in Barcelona learning Spanish and I used to have to get a bus from my, the house where I was living to the school every day. 40 minutes there, 40 minutes back. And on the bus, I remember just speaking to myself about everything that I could see happening. And it was just a great way to, uh, to, to, to keep the foreign language fresh in your mind, keep practicing at every opportunity. So just try to incorporate English into your daily life as much as possible. Do I have a podcast? I do not have a podcast, no. 
Nope, I don't. Um, hey, maybe one day. Never say never, but I, I don't at the moment. I certainly don't have any time in my working day for new, many new projects. Um, so not at the moment. Okay. I think, everybody, that um, maybe one or two more questions, but I think then I'm going to have to call it a day and finish. Remember, that is the address. If you want to check out my website and my courses, then that is the address. Also, I don't know if you've seen my ebook. That is called English Quick Fix. There's a link in the description for that. Uh, or you can go there, book.englishquickfix.com. It's a free book. And in that book, I explain common differences between common, commonly confused words, the, the, the typical mistakes that most students make. I'm sure you make some of the mistakes in that book. So a good way of uh, learning a little bit more with me is by downloading that. And you can get that in the description. There is a link right there. Okay. We'll finish there then. So thank you, everybody, for all your questions. It's been uh, really great, really great to have such participation from you. I'm glad I could do this and, um, and help you with your questions. So... Mabel, if you see me, say hello in Santiago. <laughs> um, and it's been a pleasure. So I will be in touch on Friday next week with a new video. If you have any requests, as I said, please just leave a comment asking me which videos you want, differences, phrasal verbs about, blah, blah, blah. How do you pronounce, blah, blah, blah. Um, just ask me in the comments to this video and I will always do my best to answer you in a video. Okay, so thanks everybody and I'll see you very soon. Bye for now.